there's a race uh, for who's going to become superior in the next phase of military development. And we certainly want to maintain American military superiority, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. Welcome to G-Zero World, I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we are talking about one of the most consequential relationships between any two countries in the world. It's the United States and China. Both sides have committed to re-engage with each other diplomatically after hitting a low point during the infamous spy balloon incident last year. Remember? Balloon goes over the US, US shoots it down. Oh yeah, we were worried about that for a while. Not anymore. There were signs of a thaw after Presidents Xi Jinping and Joe Biden met at a summit in San Francisco last November. No balloons in sight. But there's still a lot of daylight, and really no trust, between the two countries. Both have engaged in tit-for-tat tariffs and trade restrictions, Washington pushing to ban or force ByteDance to spin off China-owned TikTok, while iPhone sales in China are plummeting. Militarily, China continues to increase its presence in the South China Sea, and Taiwan's defense minister recently confirmed U.S. special forces were training on its outer islands, right next to mainland China. So how stable is the U.S.-China relationship really? Are we adversaries? Are we frenemies? Are we toxic codependents? Do we hate each other? What do the world's two biggest economies and largest militaries agree on? And where are they still nautical miles apart? I'll get into all that and more with my guest today, U.S. Ambassador to China, Nick Burns, who joins me straight from Beijing. But first. On April 10, 1971, nine ping pong players inadvertently became America's most important diplomats. The name of the communist leader, Mao Zedong. When the Communist Party came to power in 1949, China closed itself off to the Western world. And the ping pong players they were the first Americans to officially enter the People's Republic in a quarter century. The national teams met at the World Championships in Japan, and the Chinese government invited the Americans for an exhibition match and a week-long visit. The infamous ping pong diplomacy incident was a powerful symbol of cultural exchange and openness. I mean, they all like ping pong, so how different could they be? The next year, Nixon made his historic trip to China and sent a clear message that the period of Chinese isolation was over. I think one of the results of our trip, we hope, may be that uh, the walls that are erected, uh, whether they are physical walls like this or whether they are other walls of uh, ideology or philosophy, uh, will not divide peoples in the world. The walls came down. China opened up integrated into the world economy and expanded its global ambitions. Foreign investment flooded in, exports skyrocketed, its economy ballooned to the second largest in the world. And today, the People's Republic is again emerging from a long period of isolation, this time a little different from COVID, with a stagnated economy in desperate need of a boost. But instead of openness, China's most dominant leader since Mao Zedong is building its walls back up. Outside China, President Xi Jinping has been on a charm offensive, inviting Western CEOs to have more foreign investment. But inside China, Xi's vision is one of nationalism and greater centralized control. China emerged from the pandemic more insular, more regimented. The Chinese Communist Party has implemented major crackdowns in the technology, finance, real estate, and medical sectors, targeting anything perceived as too powerful. The messaging inside China right now, Western influence is a threat to national identity. English language has been significantly restricted in schools and entertainment. Social media is flooded with bloggers attacking anyone remotely perceived as non-patriotic. Sweeping new security laws on the mainland and in Hong Kong make even basic interactions with foreigners dangerous. President Xi's nationalist vision has become so dominant, it's written into the constitution and official history of the People's Republic. His idea of a singular Chinese identity is used to justify mass deportation of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang and forced unification with Taiwan. None of this is to say that China will return to the isolation of the Mao era. That seems impossible. The world needs China, and Xi has said he has no intention of decoupling from the global economy. She doesn't want to lose the economic benefits of globalization, but he has also made the country more hostile to some of the ideas that fueled its transformation in the first place. 
Modern China was built on openness and global connection. Forgetting that could be what prevents President Xi from continuing his country's miraculous rise into the future. What does Xi Jinping's vision mean for the future of one of the most important bilateral relations in the world, the United States and China? Can the two countries overcome their significant differences to find areas of cooperation with so much geopolitical conflict? I'm talking with the U.S. Ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Nick Burns, who joins me today from Beijing. Ambassador Nick Burns, so good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Ian. Um, U.S.-China relations, always uh, the big, you know, sort of uh, animal in the, the room. Uh, wondering right now, how much better do you feel about how well managed that relationship is compared to when you showed up a couple of years ago? Well, Ian, as usual, when you talk about the U.S.-China relationship, it's complicated. Um, on the one hand, I think we do have a somewhat more stable relationship since President Biden met with President Xi back in mid-November in San Francisco. But here's the big button. Here's what makes it complicated. We have a systemic rivalry between us and a very competitive relationship on technology, on, on military security in the Indo-Pacific, on trade and investment. And of course, we have a profound difference between us on human rights and on human freedom. So like anything else in this relationship, it's a question of balance. I think it's more of a competitive relationship, much more than it is a partnership relationship, but we try to work with the Chinese where our interests are aligned. Climate change, fentanyl are two good examples of that. Maybe the issue that's gotten the most headlines uh, between the U.S. and China over the last few weeks has been TikTok, the idea that the Americans are going to require uh, the Chinese ByteDance, the firm ByteDance, to spin off TikTok, sell it, uh, if they want to continue to operate in the United States. It's been a bipartisan push, uh, and uh, the Chinese obviously unhappy about this. This is one of their crown jewels technologically. Uh, take us through what it means. Well, it's interesting. I think we'll have to see what the Senate does and what Congress does um, before we'll know what the prescription here is. But the discussion here has been fascinating. Uh, lots of people, actually millions of people in this, in the in nationalist netizens online, essentially decrying the fact that there might be limits or a change to TikTok in the United States. I find that to be interesting because, of course, TikTok itself is not allowed in China. There's a Chinese version of it, but the version in the United States is not allowed. Facebook is not allowed in China. Uh, Google is not allowed in China. So for Chinese to complain that somehow the United States uh, wants to have an American company, may, may want to have an American company running TikTok, um, I find that a little bit surreal because of the all the blockade on American technology here. It's difficult to get American media here. And so it's a little bit like the pot calling the kettle black. The fact is there's been a technology blockade here in China for many, many years against all the leading American technology platforms. I think it's really uh, about competition from those firms. And it's about the firewall that has been set up here to insulate the Chinese people from the rest of the world, from the internet in the rest of the world. So I think that's what's really what it's all about. Now, uh, we're just coming out of the China Development Forum, uh, and uh, you had some 17 American CEOs, among many others, uh, that made a trip um, out to China uh, to meet with Xi Jinping, among other things. Uh, the report that I'm getting is a little bit more confidence on the part of Chinese officials that the economy is not collapsing, that China's power has not peaked. Um, are you feeling that on the ground in your uh, conversations with Chinese officials? Well, obviously the economy is a big, big part of what I do here as the American ambassador, what my team does. We have a $575 billion two-way trade relationship. China's our third largest trade partner. We have thousands of American companies working here, so it really matters. And I think um, there's no question that the economy here is not gonna fail. Um, but they are heading towards a future of lower, lower single-digit growth. Most of the American companies, if not nearly all of them, are staying. China's a huge market. And a lot of these companies have been here for decades. So we're not seeing countries companies just leave. On the other hand, you're not seeing many big new investments by American companies. And I think, Ian, it's because 
there are two messages that they're hearing from the government here in Beijing. One, which was heard very clearly during uh, the China Development Forum last week and from President Xi and the Premier Li Chang, China's open for business. China wants foreign businesses. Investments will be protected, that kind of thing. On the other hand, uh, the government has made no qualms about the fact that national security is their highest goal. And that could mean things like raiding American firms, which happened a year ago, several mm -hmm. American firms raided some of their employees, Chinese employees still, unfortunately and unjustly, in jail. It's also the amendment to the Counter Espionage Act, which went into effect here in China on July 1st, 2023, which defines espionage in such an opaque, non-transparent way that it unnerves people about coming here, some executives. And so I think there's a tension, if you will, between these two messages, we're open for business, but the national security state, control of data is another example of that, is really the imperative. And that confusion about the message has stalled, I think, a lot of investment here. There's um, a term of art that we hear a lot uh, from the administration, the Biden administration, uh, de-risking, that uh, American corporations should de-risk their exposure to the Chinese economy. Now, that doesn't mean ending the trade relationship, of course, and as you just suggested, it's very large. But is it fair to say that the Biden administration would like to see overall reduced U.S. exposure to the Chinese economy? Um, our message is a little bit more specific than that. Um, message number one is we don't favor a decoupling of the two economies, but we do use this term de-risking, originally coined, by the way, by the president of the EU Commission, Commission Ursula von der Leyen. And it means that we're trying to alter our supply chains and critical materials and critical minerals so that they're closer to home. That was a fundamental lesson, I think, that everybody learned during the pandemic. And in our case, what we've specifically done in October 2022, for instance, by, um, by the Commerce Department, is prohibit the sale of advanced semiconductors, American semiconductors to China for use in AI research, because those kind of that kind of technology can be used to assist the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, to achieve a qualitative improvement in their military capability to compete with us. And we're not going to do that. So in critical areas essential for our national security, we're not going to permit trade. And here's what's interesting about it. China's doing the same thing. In fact, China started to de-risk well before the United States did, years before. China does not permit the sale of its most advanced technologies that could be dual use used for military purposes to the United States and hasn't done that, done so for years. And the Chinese are very rapidly de-risking themselves, trying to make sure that they're self-sufficient or near so in areas that are critical to them. This is a very rational choice that the two governments are making. What makes it a little bit strange is that there's a lot of complaints that I receive from my Chinese counterparts about our de-risking strategy. And I remind them, you're doing the same thing. Right. I think you know, Ian, in fact, we've talked about it. There's a race uh, for who's going to become superior in the next phase of military development that comes out of these new technologies, including artificial intelligence, including quantum systems. And we certainly want to maintain American military superiority, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, particularly as we are compared against the qualities of the People's Liberation Army. So there's just no way that we're going to allow the sale of these dual-use technologies. And right. our actions have been limited to a small yard. So we're going to stick to that. It's the only way forward to achieve what we need to achieve, to achieve and that is um, fairness in trade, but also to keep out of the hands of the Chinese leadership our most sensitive dual-use technology. But uh, I, let's move on to uh, a couple of the, the most challenging issues out there, um, Taiwan and South China Sea. Uh, we had uh, the Taiwanese election. There were so many journalists that were that said that if Mr. Lai, the for, vice president, outgoing vice president, were to win, um, that it was going to lead to more confrontation between the U.S. and China. So far, it doesn't appear that that is the case. I mean, he won pretty convincingly, but the relationship seems reasonably stable. Is that is that a fair assessment or are there things we're not seeing? Well, I think it's been reasonably quiet. 
and that's a good thing. I mean, we've 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 adhered, Ian, as you know, to a, a specific one China policy ever since um, President Nixon went to China in 1972. It's evolved over time, but we've been very consistent that we think that the only solution uh, to the cross-strait tensions between the People's Republic of China and Taiwan a, a peaceful solution. So that's our mantra. And we do everything we can to encourage dialogue and to encourage especially the government in Beijing to focus on, um, on um, what they can do to enhance communication with the other side. And we'd like them to commit to unequivocally to a peaceful solution, which they haven't done. But I think that has to be the standard in terms of the basic stability of that critical waterway. I think you know that more than half the container traffic in the world flows through the Taiwan Strait on a daily, weekly basis. And so consider if the Taiwan Strait were ever to be closed because of conflict, the catastrophic implications for the global economy. That's just on the economic side, but also the war and peace consequences for basic strategic stability in this part of the world is obviously a front order priority as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I will say that um, I, I'm a little more concerned these days about the status quo not holding in the South China Sea, uh, at least near term, uh, than I am in Taiwan. Do you believe that we are closer to conflict uh, between the United States and China on this issue than we have been before? So our policy is that um, uh, China should not seek to coerce or intimidate the government of the Philippines at Second Thomas Shoal. Nearly all countries support the Philippines, including the United States. And so we regularly talk to the government of China about this and um, suggest to them that they should cease their intimidation of the Philippines. We also have said, and you've heard Secretary Blinken say this just a couple of weeks ago when he was in Manila, that the um, mutual defense treaty that we have with the Philippines from 1951 applies. And so we hope very much that the Chinese are gonna understand there is acute international interest here. And uh, the Philippines has an absolute right to resupply in that particular shoal and other areas where they have uh, they're part of their exclusive economic zone or their sovereign territory. So is it is it uh, fair to say that there's more risk uh, given the lack of precedent uh, and the, the lack of a uh, existing structure uh, between the United States and China on uh, Second Thomas Shoal than there is around Taiwan right now? It's hard to compare the two. I think they're both, you know, very important for stability in this region. We're always concerned and have been always concerned about Taiwan, and that's why we message that to the government of China routinely. But, but Ian, I would grant you the tensions uh, around Second Thomas Shoal over the last several months have been really palpable. So the United States and the rest of the world expect China, the People's Republic of China, to commit to a peaceful resolution of this problem on Second Thomas Shoal. We have no doubt that the Philippines is in the right and so we expect China to act responsibly here. Uh, so before I close, you're working with, um, engaging with a government uh, run arguably by the most powerful man in the world. Uh, Xi Jinping has consolidated an incredible amount of power uh, since he first uh, took over the Communist Party. I'm wondering what's it like, what's it been like for you to be America's lead diplomat engaging in that system? Well, it's it's a really uh, compelling time here in China because it's been clear since the 20th Party Congress that the rise of the party here is quite significant in terms of uh, recent uh, Chinese history. And certainly we're dealing, I'm dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with an extraordinarily powerful government. And as you say, a, a powerful leader. And so it's incumbent upon us uh, to be talking with them about all these challenges to global security, as well as to the challenges of our bilateral relationships. If I think about uh, the U.S.-China relationship, it's a systemic rivalry. It'll likely to be a systemic rivalry well into the 2030s between the two largest economies in the world, the two strongest militaries in the world, the two strongest technology and AI societies in the world. And so what happens here is very consequential. 
And um, I hope that we'll be able to conduct this relationship in such a way that we defend our interests, obviously, but as President Biden often says, that we act responsibly and drive down the probability of any kind of conflict, because that would be, of course, catastrophic. So that's how I see my job representing President Biden. And the United States has an interest in, um, in making sure that our interests are met here on all these national security issues. Ambassador Nick Burns, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Ian. That's our show this week. Come back next week. If you like what you see, or even if you don't, we want to hang in China for a while. We've got you covered. Hey, we'll give you a free ticket. Take a minute, only one way, to sign up for our most excellent morning newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily.